going to read to you a, a scripture, just one verse, but I'll, I'll do it um, from a couple of translations. Um, so it will be the same thing, but different translation. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, it tells us, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Another translation amplified says, In this freedom, Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then, and do not hampered and held and snared and submit again to a yoke of slavery, which you have once been put, put, up, put in. And then I'll read it from another translation, the message. It says, Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. Amen. You know, um, the songwriter says, Bob Marley says, we ourselves are the ones that are going to free our mind and emancipate ourselves. I think the first step to freedom is to have freedom in your mind, to emancipate yourself from mental slavery. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It's you and I. Take that a little personally. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this special occasion this afternoon. We want to thank you, yes, to remember that day and those days gone back. But we want to thank you for freedom. We want to thank you for true emancipation within ourselves. And instead of us getting bitter, let's get better. Let us progress. Let us move in the freedom where we are called to. And we thank you for this emancipation. We thank you for the proceedings of these services today. And we pray God blessing upon it. We thank you for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of our God. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Honorable Andrew A. Foy, Premier and Minister of Finance. Honorable Dr. Natalia Whitley, Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Agriculture, and Fisheries. Honorable Mark H. Vanderpool, Representative for the 4th District. Honorable Melvin M. Turnbull, represented for the second district, and let me go back and mention Honorable Kai Reimer, Deputy Premier. We want to welcome all, just in case I miss any. Yes, Honorable, how could I miss him? He was there with us all day. Yes, Honorable, Honorable Whitley, we want to thank you for being here as well. I also want to recognize all the other members of the House of Assembly, both past and present. We want to welcome you here to this special occasion. I want to acknowledge the Reverend Dr. Claiborne Lee, our guest speaker, senior pastor of Mount Calvary Baptist Church, Fairfield, California. And of course, we also want to recognize Pastor Frankie Rathenham, pastor of Tower of Faith, and all the other members of the clergy, other distinguished guests. We want to recognize the media, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, everyone, everywhere. Good afternoon. Let's hear that one more time. Good afternoon. It is true. This year marks the 65th anniversary of festival as we know it. The record also shows that long before and up until 1954, it was the church that led the celebrations each year 
led by a different church, alternated between the Methodist and the Anglican churches. Let's hear it for the church. It is also very noteworthy that this year also signals the 185th year of emancipation from physical slavery. And we can join with the writer, hitherto had the Lord helped us. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, somebody tell me, where would we be? We cannot, as a people, on one hand, talk about how the Lord helped our ancestors and then find another explanation for why we made it and why we are making it today. We have got to consistently remember that it is the Lord who has brought us this far. Let it be known to all of us that God is our help in ages past, or hope for years to come, or shelter from the stormy blasts, and or eternal home. Do I have a witness? This is the 23rd anniversary of Virgin Islands Heritage Month Committee leading the charge, and our theme this year is legacy. Now is the time. May I remind us as a people that we come from a rich heritage and a long legacy. The mother of civilization, the mecca of inventions, survivors of the most brutal and inhumane system, and still we are able to love. Give God praise for that. As our territory stands at the crossroads, let us not be confused nor afraid. We have been in tough times before. We have been through worse and made it. When others said and told us that we couldn't, we did. As the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And Mayor Angelo says, you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Did you want me or did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soul, cries. You may shoot me with words, your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Out of the husks of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise. Bring the gifts that my ancestors give. And I am the dream and the hope of the slave. Say with me, I rise. I rise. I rise. I rise. I rise. I rise. Fellow Virgin Islanders, brothers and sisters from all parts of the diaspora, in light of such a great legacy of faith, hope, and love, I declare to us today that now is the time to return to the God of our fathers and mothers. Now is the time to truly love one another. Now is the time to put country above self. Now is the time to denounce greed and covetousness. I declare to us today that now is the time to regain our culture of respect for one another and be the best selves. I submit to you today that now is the time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome to Emancipation Service 2019. Put your hands together.
Today, we are privileged to have all of you here today and the many that are listening by radio as a reminder that God is good and God has brought us this far. At this time, we would like you to put your hands together and welcome to the podium the, podium, the Honorable Andrew A. Foy, Premier of the Virgin Islands. God bless you, sir. Good afternoon, and God's blessings to everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm not hearing you. If we are free, and you feel you are free in every facet of the world, show a great good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I say God's blessings to everyone, especially our future speaker. And uh, this tradition is not just a tradition, it's a recognition of what our ancestors fought so hard for. But I'd like to get you involved because this emancipation period this year, I have been consistently consistent with the same message. So I want you to get like we in church and high five your neighbor on the right and tell them that the blood speaks. That neighbor isn't a good enough neighbor. So high five your neighbor on the left and tell them that the blood speaks. You see, whenever we go to the doctor and we, the, he asks us what's wrong with us, one of the first steps he does is he takes our blood. He takes our blood because the blood speaks. And the blood work will help him to diagnose what's wrong. But more so the blood work will help him to get the prescription that he sees fit to fix what's wrong. But that's just all blood in our body. But I want every single Virgin Islander and everyone under the sound of my voice who believe in emancipation, who truly believe in freedom, to remember that our ancestors' blood is speaking. The blood that they shed in this territory for us to be free. The blood that they had to shed in the territory from the slave masters who ill-treat them had them against their will, took them from their husbands, did everything uh, unmannerly, known to man, so that we could be free. Because if we truly understand what our ancestors went through in these Virgin Islands, in the Caribbean, and in the world for us to be free, we will never ever let them down. Today when we march from the government house up, to the Sunday morning well. We didn't march down to the Sunday morning well. We march up to the Sunday morning well. That's out of a significance because every step that I took today was one in which I heard my ancestors' blood speaking, saying, Son, come up to a higher level because you're going up to the Sunday morning well where you are freed. When I took every step I took, I could hear my ancestors saying, Children, remember my struggles so that you don't repeat and end up in slavery when you could be free. Every step that I took, I heard the answer says, saying, come up with your dignity. Ladies, come up with your pride. Gentlemen, come up with your respect and your behavior. Every step that we took today, marching from the government house is telling us that we're gonna come up from those who think that they have us down. That's the beauty about what our ancestors have, pled, have put in us through their blood. But greater than our ancestors, I'm a firm believer that the blood of Jesus Christ is speaking. And that blood is stronger than that of the ancestors. So anyone that goes into slavery now and don't understand that they are already free by the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't understand what has been done for us. So once you understand that you are free, you will not change what you are doing you'll transform because you see a caterpillar doesn't change into a butterfly because if it changed into a butterfly it could always change back but a caterpillar transform into a butterfly which means that it is liberty is freedom it can fly and it can never go back into a caterpillar once you understand what your ancestors have done what jesus christ's blood has done for you you can never go back into slavery but it all starts with your mind. Understanding that the freedom 
you need is in your mind. And once you free your mind, then you will remain free indeed. So I just stop by as a premier to give you an unconventional speech to let you to know, to remind you, and to strengthen you to know that you are already free. Amen. Free in Jesus Christ. Amen. So you will not commit crimes. You will not go out there shooting others. Like what I have heard in Dallas and all these other places. Those are people that don't understand that they're free. Whether white or black. Because can I tell you that although slavery has happened to blacks, slavery by definition have nothing to do with your race. It has to do with conditions. And if you understand that yes, the blacks will have a deeper history of being suppressed, so we automatically just link it to blacks alone. But it deals with suppressive conditions. Don't become a slave to money. Don't become a slave to power. Don't become a slave to ignorance. Don't become a slave to idols. Don't become a slave to the church because the church is not the building of the pastor, it's you. So once you understand that you're free, then you will fly like the butterfly that has transformed from the caterpillar into the butterfly. God's blessing and let's continue to move like we understand, respect, love and appreciate that we are free. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. The simple message is, the blood speaks. Let's call now on the African Studies Club, and they have a tremendous presentation for us. Let's put our hands together for the African Studies Club at Christopher and Company. Honorable Premier and members of the House of Assembly, uh, good afternoon guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's our honor and our privilege to join you here this afternoon from the African Studies Club with a role play entitled Reflections of the Angel Ancestors. It was written by Dr. Catherine Smith, Director of Virgin Island Studies, Acting Director of Virgin Island Studies at the H. Lab Community College. The situations reflected upon are taken from historical records and documents. Most of the names are real persons in Virgin Islands history. There will be a pop quiz at the end to see if you can identify those names which were real and those ones which were fictional. So we're going to invite you to come along with us on a journey as our angel ancestors or elders in heaven, Mr. Ellick and Miss Feely yes. sit down and reflect on some of their remembrances of their time in the Virgin Islands. Mr. Alex sits relaxing playing one of his favorite musical instruments, the drum. Miss Feely walks by 
and is happy to see Mr. Elick. She takes a seat and joins him. Mr. Elick, how nice to see you today. How things going up here over in your corner of heaven? Miss Feely, it is good to see you too. I just here sitting, relaxing, reminiscing about all time and art in our small corner of the world, the Virgin Islands. Those days were not easy. Living during the time of enslavement before our children became free. Do you remember how, how all of us wanted to live on the Keys because life was a little better there? There was more freedom there. A lot of times we managed our own affairs even though we were slaves. Sometimes there wasn't even a white planter on the key with us. Check, check, check. Which one of them check, keys we used to live on again, check. buddy? We used to live and work on Virgin Gorda, what it used to call it Spanish Town, Anigada, Just Van Dyke, Peter Island, Beef Island, Guana Island, Norman Island, Cooper Island, the Caminos, Ginger Island, Great Thatch, Salt Island, Prickly Pear, Frenchman's Key, Great Tobago, and Buck Island. Everywhere. You will remember? I remember at least seven of those islands had not a free person on them, not a white person on them. It was so much better for we living on them keys, growing cotton, farming our provisions, raising our livestock, fishing, salt raking. You remember the wrecks? It was so much better than working on those horrible sugar plantations on Tartola. That was hard, my son. Very little flat land, steep hillsides. You know why it is to establish a sugar plantation in them there hills? Eh? Yes, I do, Mr. Ellick. And do you remember those awful slave laws that dictated our lives? Death for planning any rebellion or re escape. Death for striking or opposing any white person. Death for the poisoning of any white person or even attempting to poison. Well, sir, that there was their greatest fear, poisoning. We couldn't beat drums, blow horns, have meetings. We had to get tickets to travel off the plantations. Remember when they had to stop us planting and selling cotton ourselves? At least they never took away our provision grounds. That was because them know. Miss Feely, them know that without them provisions that we used to bring to Rotong for the market day, which used to feed all of them, they would have go hungry. I never tell you, Miss Feely, but you remember my great aunt, Miss Esther? Well, her house was one of the central locations for them runaways. It's true? Yeah, Miss Esther don't talk about it a lot, but not even up here. Up here, she's still absorbing the strict code of secrecy. You know what she used to, you know what used to really make me laugh though? No matter how much times them planters write Mother England to pressure Spain to return the runaways from Puerto Rico, it never used to work at all. The Spanish governors would, would just won't agree. All you had to do was become Catholic and you were free. And we just keep running there, building boats together, stealing vessels, even with all the punishment in them dreadful slave laws. Punishing all the runaways and anybody who helped them. Do you remember the Strumu at Josiah's Bay? When that planter, what's your name again? Isaac Pickering had the whole slave gang sold to Trinidad. When he was under investigation, he had tell a lie. He on truth. He pretended like we had to go. We agreed to go. Now, why would we have ever wanted to part with our family, our friends, our provision grounds to go to Trinidad to work on sugar plantations, and the next thing you know, we're dead? Mr. Ellick, he did send them, you know. After the slave hunters got them from the hills, he lied, and he tell the family and friends to come and say goodbye the Sunday morning, and when they reached, he had already sent them the night before. You should, should have hear the screams of the mothers pregnant wives, children who had come to town to say goodbye and had to catch a Methodist minister's quick to console them, 
to give them comfort. Girlie, that ain't nothing. You remember the men at the time and all the things that happened to we? You remember the separations? You remember Harry and Margaret? They married for years, you know, and had lived together for more than nine years with them children. But he belonged to another owner and was walking out country. When he reached town, his dear wife, whom he loved with great affection, and her children them gone. He went to his house and didn't find them. He managed to see the vessel in the distance transporting them to Grenada. Do you remember how he prayed for death to take it? You remember Brother Sam on Tadman Estate? He fell unconscious on the beach when his wife and children were wrenched out of Yehandem and shipped out of the colony. Do you remember the contempt they had for slave marriages? You know something? We had really come into this, we had really come into this place as captured warriors, as slaves, I tell you. Tis, there was a white male planter dominated island. The threat and use of violence was to keep things in place. For so much centuries, we watch our cheering them soul from under you. Can't protect your woman. We had to bow and say, yes, master, no, master. We lost our place as father, protector, and provider. That is the one that get me. I still cry even after all these centuries. We were so happy to be free so we could get our families back together again. And do you know it was only because of my ancestor, Diana Nottingham, at the free village of Long Look, who was able to purchase the freedom of her husband, Jeffrey Pickering, who was one of the slaves on the same Isaac Pickering plantations, that they were able to be together and I was even able to be born. If she hadn't have done that, he would have been shipped off with all the rest of them to Trinidad, Trinidad, never to see his beloved back, Diana, again. But I wonder how they are doing, the families. I hope their families are healthy and their children are prospering. Your tears them put me in mind of Margaret and Elsie. Even her is like they've never recovered from what happened on the Arthur Hodge plantation. Remember how that madman had suspected Margaret, a cook, and Elsie, a washer, of poisoning his wife and children? He said he would put an end to them. I remember their screams, scalded mouths, and them dead. He had poured boiling water down them throat. Look, let me tell you, majority of his slave them on this plantation perished from his sadistic ways. Miss Perrine, let's check on them from time to time. But I want to know if you remember that one time we had planned to take the island from the whites and rule it ourselves. McDonald was captain of the slave troops. While the men were burning the town, the women were to stay in the country and burn the sugar canes and the plantation works. And if we won that war, Uncle Limerick and Uncle Shelley from the Joe's Hill Estate were to be our great leaders. Even after all this time, I still so hot at the elder one who betrayed the revolution. Oh, and Colin and Cotton from the Bruce Bay Estate. They told everything at the slave trials. Forgiveness, Miss Feely. Forgiveness. Remember where you is. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if they'd still remember us at their emancipation festival. You think they remember Uncle Limerick and Uncle Shelley? You think they even remember Miss Perrine? You think they remember the freedom fighters at Josiah's Bay? It was so nice when they decided to remember that precious freedom by having festivities. Then they started the set on the field in our honor. They had parade and festival queen in our honor. We had to work so hard for their freedom or we would have children with those planters just so those children could be free. You remember how Boyce, Jenny, Betsy, Fanny, Fibber, Margaret, and Rachel all had children for the planter, Mr. George Martin? The last time I had counted, Mr. Martin had fathered 19 children with these women. Remember how we used to have to foster good relations with the slave masters and mistresses using subservience and submission. 
just so they could grant us manumission? Then turn right around and purchase the freedom of our brothers and sisters whenever we could. All the things we did. Remember that day, 1st August 1834, when we gathered at the church them to hear the Emancipation Proclamation? What a wonderful day. I haven't checked on the chair them in a little while, but I wonder how them doing, how them faring. The last time I checked, they were managing well. Living together, <laughs> living together as one, helping one another build them, house them, living in faith, church was central, extended families living together in villages. They grew all they needed to eat and made all the clothes, basket, hats that they needed. They fished and farm. I was so proud of them. Such nice people all cheering them grow into. They were doing so well that 20 years after emancipation, they owned the soil. Look at thing. We come in as property, a sad time in our history as a people. But they ended up being the owners of production. They own the land. Look at this now, lad. We lost our beautiful African names, branded, sold as property, taking, taking on the last names of the plantations that we walk on. They turned them slave names into beautiful extended families of the Virgin Islands. I wonder how they're doing, and if them does remember we at their emancipation festival. You know something? I heard that Miss Perrine was just there the other day. Let me call she and see if she could give you an update now. Miss Perrine, Miss Perrine. Where are you calling me from? <laughs> Girl, Miss Perrine, how the children doing? We haven't checked on them in a little while now. How the people? They just still work together and live together so well, doing their farming and fishing, building their homes together, working the land they owned. Do they still build and sell the beautiful wooden boats they called the sloops? Girl, I don't even know where to begin. Them give up farming long time. Don't walk the soil no more. And then barely fishing. Them take on a thing called tourism and financial services. Now these industries brought them great wealth. But they brought a whole set of other things too. How can I describe this to you? The wealth created an economy where a lot of migration flooded the soil. It was a steady ongoing flood from all over. Girl, the last time I checked, them had over a hundred nationalities represented on those small islands. You ask if they still live together as one? Now let me try to explain this. What if had villages before with 10 or so extended families living well together? Now seven out of every 10 families is from somewhere else. Now you know we were always a hospitable people, but it had to tell how our children fairy got to mix up all the tricks and between. I can't tell you how much of the land that we gave our blood for that they still own. You ask if they're making wooden sloops, they're not gone out of style. There's a thing called the yachting industry. And these little islands are the sailing capital of the world. But they don't own them boats anymore. And they don't own that industry. At best, they might have a few who repair them. And if you're lucky, one or two captains will chatter a week or so. And how can I describe this? You know how the families had come to own the keys you talked about? Well, these days, the majority of those keys are privately owned. Alaguana, Mosquito, Nam, and Pita, where all families used to make their home. Miss Perrine, I wonder if you know what you're saying. Oh, wait, there's more. I wasn't finished. It tastes rice and it's rice and peas now. It tastes peas and rice. Restaurant. But guess what? 
The restaurants come with Italian food, Indian food, Chinese food, not even one with the African food of our ancestors. And when you're looking for all traditional foods like fish and mayonnaise, sauce, cassava, bread, jammy cake, every one or two places you can go and you better know where to find it. What has happened? What has happened? How come them lose connection? Wait till, wait till them, uh, wait, please, wait, tell me them does remember we at festival though? Do they remember we the ancestors? Mr. Elliot, them don't even know about me carrying charges. Much less to try. They don't know about the freedom fighters that just say as big. Not even Uncle Limerick or Uncle Shelley. But how it is they forget about me carrying charges? I am the one who gave the testimony that had ever had you hung. Everybody thought it was just prosper and kill for picking the men. Oh, they don't even know the majority of the slaves on that plantation. He killed in his sadistic ways. When I finished my testimony, the die was cast. And listen, this had an impact on the entire Caribbean. A white planter was hung for a murder of a slave. Times was changing. And hold on. I'm not really talking about the true meaning of the Emancipation Festival anymore. Very few. Most of us take it for a big party, a fete, a walk up. Walk up? What that is? Girls, <laughs> don't go there. I might have to explain to you about body paint. I was just telling you, we are not on their minds. The meaning of freedom is not on their minds. The door remember everything we went through. They don't even really realize or reflect on their progress as all children since them times of enslavement. And we sacrifice everything to give them freedom. What can we do? Wait, all is not lost. I remember how proud we were of Faulkner's boy from Anigada. He and the two others, Fonseca and De Castro, who led that grand match. That's how them get them own legislature, you know. What an achievement. Them had really stand up for themselves. I was, it was so important that 1,500 people supported them and were in the match. As a matter of fact, this year marks the 70 years since that match. Let me see how they remember that. Come, let us gather the rest. Let's find Uncle Limerick and Uncle Shelley. Let us find the freedom fighters at Josiah's Bay. Let's look for Frederick Augustus Pickering, Hope R. Stevens, Theodore Faulkner, Glani Fonseca, Lindy Castro, Lindy De Castro. Let us find H. Laverty Stout, all of them, all the people, them heroes. We can remind the children who them for, help them find their roots again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's put our hands together again for the African Studies Club. Come on, people. All right, thank you so much. Moving right along. At this time, we want to invite to the podium Dr. Honorable Natalia D. Whitley, Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Agriculture, and Fisheries. Let's give him a welcome. Good afternoon, people of the Virgin Islands. Like I hear I just say, the Virgin Islands. I enjoy that uh, skit by the African Studies Club. I'm a proud member of the African Studies Club, even though they haven't seen me for a while. I adopt the protocol which has already been established, but allow me to recognize the Premier of the Virgin Islands, Honorable Andrew Foy, ministers of government, members of the House of Assembly, Dr. Tumble and the Heritage Committee, along with our featured speaker, Reverend Dr. Clee, Cleborn Lee, Jr. It is my honor and privilege to be here with you this afternoon. We are celebrating 185 years of emancipation from this vicious institution of slavery. 
Our ancestors were robbed of their humanity as evildoers hunted and captured them like animals. They were traded like ivory or, or leather or some other lifeless commodity. They were branded like cattle, brutalized like nails being pounded by a hammer. They had no labor laws. They were walked to death. A woman could not choose who she would lay with. The man she truly loved had to watch her being mercilessly raped by a plantation owner. Slavery was no joke. Slavery was one of the highest forms of evil the earth has ever witnessed. But slavery also made way for one of the greatest triumphs of humanity in history. Our ancestors, despite their limitations, remained a spiritual people. We remained a loving and forgiving people. We held on to our respect for our elders. We maintained our dignity. The slave master could not extinguish the desire for freedom which burned within us. So we prayed, we ran, we resisted, we, in, we inspired kindness through our pleasant nature. We protested, we frustrated, we even bought our own freedom. We would not stop until we were emancipated. Our ancestors paved the way for us to have the quality of life that we have today. Are we so callous? Are we so ungrateful that we cannot say thank you? I can imagine the joy of that fateful morning when we received the news, the shouts of hallelujah, the praises to God. I can imagine the exuberant dancing in the streets, not a celebration inspired by lust or drunkenness, but a dance of thanksgiving and joyfulness. Not only did our ancestors have to overcome slavery, but they had to overcome many obstacles along the path to our present situation. They had to overcome dire economic prospects, a neglectful colonial government. They had to overcome natural disasters, taxation without representation. So the fight continued. But we built our boats, and we fished, and we sailed, and we traded, and we cleared our fields, and planted our grounds, and raised our livestock. All the while, we danced our dances, made our clothing, built our houses, raced our boats, played our music, praised our God. We crafted a life for ourselves on this precious rock we call home. The modern BVI of today did not just fall out of the sky. This year, November, will make 70 years since the Great March of 1949. At a time when the population was under 7,000 people, 1,500 persons marched to the streets of Rotown, demanding better treatment and demanding better representation. They did not have social media or our modern-day transportation, but organized the biggest demonstration in our people's history. As a result of this important historical event, our legislative council was restored, and we were able to elect local leaders who would fight for the interests of our people. You know their names, the Faulkners, the Pens, the Fonsecas, the DeCastros, the Stouts, the Malones, the Wheatleys, the Romneys, the O'Neills, the Smiths, the Georges, the Parsons, the Foys, the Flaxes, the Frasers, and all the others who have been elected to do the work of the people. It is through their collective efforts that we have raised the standard of living in the BVI along with the people of the BVI. It is through the struggle and sacrifice of persons like Noah Lloyd and Lindy DeCastro who fought for the preservation of our economic opportunities, that we have a BVI with many successful business persons, 
and a commendable level of participation by our local people. But I often ask myself, are we better off today? Are we better off today? Yes, we have big houses and fancy cars, but do we have love in our hearts for our brothers and our sisters? Yes, we have air-conditioned offices and fancy gadgets, but is, is the elderly lonely? Are we healthy and strong as we were in the past? Or are we dying off way before our time? Do we treat each other with respect? Bob Marley had a very popular song with an opening line which stated, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. The sad reality is that though we are no longer shackled by physical chains, we now experience a form of mental and spiritual bondage. The crime, the laziness, the gossiping, the backbiting, the undermining, the family disputes. I pray that we reflect on the struggles of our ancestors and we can humble ourselves and recognize where we fall short. Let us ask God to renew our spirits. I pray God removes the poison from our hearts. I pray we return to the times when we loved our neighbors as ourselves. Yes, we have departed from the values, the traditions, from the trodden path that our ancestors marched on to their freedom. But it is not too late to return to the path. Let us fight with the same tenacity for the liberation of our minds and spirits. Let us rebuild the BVI with a spirit of love and unity. Let us conduct ourselves in such a way that our Creator would say to us, my good and faithful servant, with whom I am well pleased. Let us conduct ourselves in such a way that our ancestors would be proud, just like we had the skit, and they were wondering how we were doing. They would not say we struggled in vain. With those words, I say happy emancipation, and let us continue our march towards freedom. And before I finish, let me recognize the efforts of Dr. Turnbull and the Heritage Committee, who for many years have been bringing to attention the people of the Virgin Islands, the true reason for these celebrations. Give them a round of applause. Without events such as these, our Emancipation Festival would be far from where it needs to be. And I would like for us to continue to walk towards making our Emancipation Festival more about emancipation, more about the culture and the history, so that instead of two tents here, next time we have four and five and six tents filled with persons grateful, grateful for the struggles of our ancestors who allowed for us to have the opportunities we have here today. So I thank you for your kind attention, and I'm looking forward to a, a very successful emancipation, emancipation celebration, the few days that we have remaining. Thank you. In a summary, are we better off? Ladies and gentlemen, I want you now to join me in welcoming the head of humanities of the H. Lavity Stout Community College, the one, the only, Miss Rochelle Smith. Let's put our hands together. Good afternoon. The last time we met up, I told you, and you even heard about her earlier, about Pirin Georges. And you are like that so much that some of you are now meeting me and calling me Pirin. I don't mind it so much, but there are so many people in our BVI history that I have to tell you all about. Don't rename me too quick. Today I am leaving Pirin in the 1800s and I'm coming a little closer to the modern day to remind you about not one woman, 
but a group of women who without their hard work, many of us would not be here today. And to help me tell my tale, I brought the youngest of my 10 children, <laughs> Trifina Theodosia Thomas. <laughs> Somebody come hold the child so I could talk to the people, please. Mind you. Today, I want to give tribute to the grannies, the midwives, who from before the 1920s and up to the 1960s literally helped bring generations of BVI Islanders into this world. They had no medical training except for their own experiences, but they were able to assist women in their communities in their travails. Nowadays, I here I have 40, 11 people in a hospital room full of shiny equipment. Well, it was me, Father God, and a midwife I called Cousin Silly in the chamber. And this one, that one the pastor holding for me, and all the 10 others came out just fine, thank God. It all started with a call, not a WhatsApp call or a cell phone call. Sometimes a literal call across the hill, Cousin Silly, come, come. In this case, when I felt myself going, night had done set in. And the husband of mine sent two of the older boys for Cousin Silly. They turned off full speed through the night with just a flambeau to light their way. And they had to go cross Pompey level and down through the holler before they could reach Miss Silly in Soldier Hill. Two twos, they were back. They said from the time they knock on the door and call out, they hear her say, oh, can see ready, I coming. Next thing they know, Cousin Silly was outside with her cloak on, her hat on her head, and her bag in her hand. She took the flamboy out of them by hand, and it looked like them had the devil to keep up with her coming across the level. By the time she reached, I was in the chamber under pain. She come in, wash her hands, and got to work. Cousin Silly checked me and realized that the time was near, and she coaxed me with encouraging words. We were there for a couple more hours before my little one made her appearance. And when she came out, the first person she saw was Cousin Silly. She checked the child good, good and then cut the navel string. These days, everything had to be sterilized, pasteurized, and magnetized. But it was so hard in them times that sometimes there's the same house scissors that you used to use for one and everything that they used to cut the umbilical cord with, and then they used to use a piece of string from the flower bag to tie it off. By the time we get through, the sun was coming up. As customary, once she determined that the child was healthy and otherwise fine, the midwife tended to me as the mother first. She dealt with the afterbirth, cleaned me up, and made me comfortable with a cup of tea. Then she tended to the child, which included putting on the belly band to ensure that the navel healed properly. These days, I don't bother with that practice. But in those times, it was the way to ensure that the navel healed properly. A belly band was made for the child again from a flower bag, and the child wore it for about three months. The mother had her band too, you know. I think these waist strainers that I wear wearing these days, taking eye your breath and making eye your faint away is a new thing. It ain't nothing new. No, sir. In them times, after you give birth, you had to bend your belly to make sure that your body parts, especially your back, heal from the labor process. And that belly band, often another piece of flower bag material was worn for at least a month. What a blessing a flower bag was in those days. When Cousin Silly finished tending to me and the child, it was high morning. She made sure we were all right before she went home to tend to her own husband, Buddy Ton, and her children. But that wasn't the last we would see of her. Of course, I had my lying in days. Nine days I had to stay in my bed. 
thank God I had my older girls to cook and mind the house for me. But every morning, bright and early, Cousin Celie was right there to look after me and the baby. She would bathe the barber, taking special care to clean and powder the navel, and make sure the belly band was properly tied. Then she would look after me. She also made sure that my girls were washing the baby clothes well and keeping everything fire clean. Three days after the birth, she made me a drink to clean me out, as she put it. Lord, have mercy. I don't know what all was in it, but it had in some castor oil, a little brandy, and some milk, and clean me out, it did. She told me that that was one of the ways to help my body catch itself. She kept coming every day as me and the barber grew stronger. On the ninth day, she boiled a bush back for me out of several different bush. I don't know. Again, I don't know what all she put in there, but I know it had in some sauce up, some bear wine, and some others. First, she gave me some out of it to drink with a touch of pan salt and a little cane rum. Then around midday, she gave me a warm bath with the balance of the backwater. Afterwards, she massaged me and stretched me to make sure that my body was back in line. Once she was satisfied that my body was in order, she gave the okay to end the lining period and for me to return to my daily duties, which now included the care of the newborn. These days, there's big money in baby delivery and doctoring. But in them times, things was hard, and people like Cousin Silly did what they did to help their community and not for financial gain. My household had not a thing to give her other than a few hands of banana and some toloma from my husband grown. But she received them gratefully. Thanks to Cousin Silly and God, I have a healthy child. What a sweet little thing she is. I see her there? The midwife I refer to in this piece is my maternal grandmother, Sylvanita Reimer, who assisted several women in Soldiers Hill and surrounding areas during childbirth. There are several men and women in the BVI today that I can proudly say that my grandmother guided into this world. And she was just one of many grannies around the BVI who did what they could to help others at a critical time. Some other BVI grannies or midwives included, also in Soldiers Hill, Janie Henley, in Brewers Bay, Manuelita Christopher and Catherine Jorgensen, in Harrigan and Diamond Estate, Leah Todman and Emily Brathwaite, in Bellevue, Coutin Bay, Long Trench, Far Hill, etc. We had Christiana Freeman, and Catherine Hetherington Parrot, known as Katie Ben. The ladies in Eastern Long Look were assisted by Martha Dawn, Rosamond Malone, Roslyn Penn, Celestine Thomas, Caroline Rapset. In Seacows Bay, we had midwives like Anna Scatliff Nibs, Brinette Forbes, Sarah Martin, Margaret Nibs, Agatha Forbes, and Eglantine Mactavius. Down in West End, we had people, West End, Carrot Bay, Little Apple Bay, people like Belviana Crook, Ann Dawson, Elizabeth Donovan, Juliana Callwood, Allegra Donovan, Christiana Smith, Charlotte Heinemann Hodge, Dolly Todman, and Teresa Tete Blyden. Over in Anigada, they were assisted by midwives like Angelina Valak, Camilla Wells, Mary White, Leslie Potter, Francis Vanterpool and Agnes Smith. Virgin Guardian mothers were assisted by Trifina George, Adita Sprav, Francis George, Caroline Kuntz, Esther O'Neill. And in Just Van Dyke, we had ladies like Rose Shinnery, Anna Callwood Milliner, Julia Hatchett, and Dolorita Juanita Hendrickson. I take the time to say all their names because we are often quick to recite the names of the international, the Florence Nightingale and the Clara Barton. But we can't afford to forget our own. We cannot afford to forget them. These women had no medical training, but they helped to deliver a nation. 
We cannot afford to forget them, and we cannot afford to drop the baton that they have passed on to us. We need more literal and figurative midwives in the BVI. We need more nurses to help deliver us and treat us at our healthcare facilities. And we need more women to take up the mantle of community building, to offer our skills and our time to make the BVI better. These ladies that I just called out, they had nothing, but they delivered the world. Now we have everything. Let our legacy not be that we delivered nothing. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. I acquired information for this presentation from Nurse Norma Benjamin's book, Nursing in the Virgin Islands, A Historical Perspective. If you haven't gotten a copy of that book, please go and get one. It gives you a rich history of nursing. And I got information from interviews with Mrs. Adina Brathwaite of Carrot Bay and Mrs. Esme Stout of Ballast Bay. I gratefully acknowledge them all for their contributions. Thank you. I need a hand for babysitting. I mean, the child is a good child. I will babysit her anytime. Not a song from her. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sister Rochelle. And in, in just a phrase, may we never forget them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we move to brief remarks by the Honorable Mark H. Vanderpool representative of the second district. Let's give him a welcome as he comes. Sorry, fourth. Well, I'm gonna put you where I want. Thank you, Pastor Mel. And uh, I can represent Mitch District and mine together, no problem. I am happy to be here, Honorable Premier Andrew Foy, and Deputy Premier, who is here, Mr. Kai Reimer, Minister Dr. Natalia Whitley, and Minister Vincent Whitley, and uh, other. District 2 representative, he's here still. Honorable Mitch Trumbull, all other members of the House of Assembly. I want to pay respects to our Reverend Dr. Clibon Lee, Jr., who's here. I reminded him that my two sons are also Morehouse men. So I hope they meet him before he leaves, one of them at least who's here. And uh, look forward to that. I am pleased indeed to greet you wonderful folks of the Virgin Islands today on this very special, and as our former chief ministers used to say, this auspicious occasion, very special occasion, to be a part of this 185th anniversary of our territory's emancipation from slavery. While we continuously look for progress as a territory and as descendants of Africa, we must not forget this terrible scourge inflicted on us by European slave masters, all in the interest of making money, in the interest of their economy. So as far as they were concerned, it was okay for our ancestors to be treated as less than humans, to be bought and sold on the auction block, to be traded by the African tribal leaders for guns and ammunition. We were sold and kept in unsanitary dungeons awaiting the terrible transatlantic crossing packed like sardines in a can in the hot hull of ships. I can never forget my experience 
in Ghana when I was taken to one of these dungeons. And even hundreds of years later, I could still, in my mind, perhaps, but perhaps so, still smell the stench of those dungeons as our ancestors had to endure waiting for the terrible cross-transatlantic ship travel. Days like these today are important reminders of these terrible times that our ancestors went through. So we are grateful to Dr. Turnbull and his team. Give them a round of applause for keeping this up to get away from the revelry and sit us down here and remind us of why we celebrate emancipation from slavery. And while we do not need to dwell on this, we must be reminded so that it never occurs in any format. Slavery never occurs again in any format. In no disguise at all, it never occurs in our country or any place in the world, covertly or overtly. So we want to make sure that although we don't want to be dwelling on it, that we are reminded of it so that it never occurs again in this life of ours. We must remember it was all about economics in those days. So we must be vigilant because it can also be all about economics in this day. You may not see it as it was then, but it can be because money and economics has its way of enslaving many of us. So continuous progress towards managing our own affairs must be our focus. This requires constitutional upgrades such as those that are due now 12 years since the last Constitution Review in 2007. And I thank our Premier for continuing the thought and the idea and making the promise, as we had done before, that very soon we will get into those talks for constitutional upgrade in the Virgin Islands. Because we must build on our institutions on our, and make them stronger. We must stand, stamp out corruption. We must develop our people, and we must unite as one. We must unite as one people here in the Virgin Islands, black people and white people, yellow and brown, people of all nations, people of many countries in the Caribbean, people of 108 nations that dwell here in the Virgin Islands, we must unite. But education is the key. And saying education is the key may be a cliche as we all know it. But so be it. Because education is key to our development and the self-determination. Education is key to preserving and protecting ourselves, our culture, our heritage. And as Bob Marley sang, and as said earlier, emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. So let us not be afraid, but believe in ourselves that we can do for us better than what others may be able to do for us. Let us believe in ourselves, my people. So on this 185th anniversary of freedom from that type of slavery, let's stamp out all types of slavery. Let's live together in peace and harmony. And as Martin Luther King, the great peacemaker said, let freedom ring. Amen. Let freedom ring today more than it did on that August day in 1834. May the God of the universe look down on us and keep us free and continue to make us free indeed. God bless you and God bless these beautiful Virgin Islands.
Thank you. In a phrase, let's remember, so it never occurs again. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to call on, I want to ask us to give a good welcome to Miss Athena Madura as she would give us what we call the Emancipation Proclamation but there is a more appropriate word for it. Let's welcome Miss Athena Maduro. many of you out here today but I'm hoping that next time we'll have so many folks that we wouldn't have seats enough. My task is to read the proclamation so here goes. Whereas diverse persons are holding in slavery within diverse of his majesty's colonies and it is just and expedient that all such persons should be manumitted and set free, and that a reasonable compensation should be made to the persons hitherto entitled to the services of such slaves for the loss which they will incur by being deprived of this right to such services. And whereas it is also expedient that provision should be made for promoting the industry and securing the good conduct of the persons so to be manumitted for a limited period after such their manumission. And whereas it is necessary that the laws now in force in the said several colonies should forthwith be adapted to the new state and relations of society therein which will follow upon such general manumission as aforesaid of the said slaves, and that in order to afford the necessary time for such adaptation of the said laws, a short interval should elapse before such manumission should take effect, be it therefore enacted by the king's most excellent majesty by and with the advice and consent of the Lords spiritual and the temporal and commons in this present parliament assembled and by and the authority of the same that from and after the first day of August 1834, all persons who in conformity with the laws now in force in the said colonies respectively shall on or before the first day of August 1834 have been duly registered as slaves in any such colony and who on the said first day of August 1834 of the full age of six years or upwards shall by force and virtue of this act, and without the previous execution of any indenture or apprenticeship or other deed or instrument of that purpose, become and be apprenticed laborers, provided that for the purposes aforesaid, each slave engaged in his ordinary occupation on the seas shall be deemed and taken to be within the colony to which such slaves shall belong. You are now free. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Administrator Officer, Department of Culture. The Reverend Dr. Clay, Clayburn Lee, Jr., 
is the pastor of Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Fairfield and Susan City, California. He is the father of four remarkable children, Cleburne III, Jillian, Christopher, and Jessica. Under Dr. Lee's leadership, Mount Calvary has experienced phenomenal holistic growth. In 2015, Dr. Lee led the church in the acquisition of 60 acres for the future construction of a mixed-use campus to facilitate the nonprofit and for-profit vision of the church. Dr. Lee is a graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. With a BA degree in religion, he received his Master of Divinity degree from Union Theological Seminary in New York City. He also earned his Doctor of Ministry degree from the United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. And in December of 2015, he graduated with a PhD in Biblical Studies from Golden State Baptist Theological Seminary in Mill Valley, California, with highest honors. His dissertation is entitled, The Humanetics of Desmond Tutu, Liberationists or Reconciliationists. Dr. Lee currently serves as an adjunct professor of New Testament at Gateway Seminar Seminary in Ontario, California. In 2000, and I want you to pay attention to this, in 2000, Dr. Lee was inducted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers at Morehouse College. In August of 2004, he was selected to attend the University of Oxford in England as a participant in the Oxford Roundtable discussion on religion, education, and government. Dr. Lee currently serves as Vice President of the National Baptist Convention, USA Incorporated. In addition, he's a proud member of Omega Sci Fi Incorporated and a lifetime member of the NAACP. Ladies and gentlemen, after the beautiful sound and voice and great ministry of Dwight Hutchison Jr., Gen Y Factor winner. The next voice that you will hear will be that of Reverend Dr. Clinton or Clayburn Lee. Let's welcome our brother and our friend. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope this afternoon that you're blessed by the song. I hope to remind you about the man who breaks cycles and breaks chains. Amen.
Stand to your feet. Let's give the brother another hand. Up. Wow. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I really want you to put your hands together and let's welcome, like only the BVI can, the Reverend Dr. Raven Lee Jr. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Turnbull. You may take your seats. Allow me to quickly express publicly as I have privately my thanks to Dr. Turnbull and the Heritage Committee for this wonderful invitation to come and share on this special occasion in the life of my brothers and my sisters in the BVI to our premier and to all of the honorable officers of government and of the community and of the church and to all of you God's children and God's people greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ the one in whom we live move and have our very being allow me to quickly say that this is a privilege to come and to share today um, on this special occasion and the day has been long for many of us and so I feel like that unknown poet who penned these words, I have but a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. And so I want to do my best this afternoon, this evening, to uh, not be everlasting, in an attempt to be eternal, all right? And so I want to share a word with you today that I believe that God wants you to leave with that will be a blessing in the days, the weeks, and the months that are yet to come. We've gathered today to commemorate the Emancipation Act of August 1st, 1834. From this very place at the well, where that Emancipation Proclamation was read announcing the liberation of slaves from the British Empire. It's a privilege to gather and it's a privilege for us together to give thanks to God for his deliverance of us, of our people, from the oppressive, exploitative, and dehumanizing hands of slave masters, many of whom claimed to be Christian. What an oxymoron. In the United States of America where I live, this year marks the recognition 
of the first known slave ships like the Mayflower that landed in the state of Virginia with our African ancestors in chains. It was 400 years ago in 1619 that the first known ships landed in Virginia with our ancestors chained head to foot in their own urine and in their own feces, less than animals in the sight of those slave masters. And our Emancipation Proclamation in the BVI was announced some 185 years ago where we celebrate here as we celebrate in America how God delivered, emancipated, freed his people from the hands of evil oppressors. One of the most significant things about this celebration is that it allows us to make sure we avoid the danger of forgetting. And if you want to take home with you what I'm going to attempt to say today, I want to talk to you about the danger of forgetting. The danger of forgetting. In the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, in chapter 8, between verse 10 and verse 20, God uses Moses to caution the freed, liberated children of Israel to never forget the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt, who led them through the wilderness, who caused them to survive things that should have killed them and to make certain that when they arrived in places of prosperity in life that they did not get amnesia and forget that it was God who had brought them that far and God who had given them the ability to gain wealth. God wanted them to understand what you and I must understand, that one thing we can never do is forget that God has liberated and emancipated us not only to be free, but to stay free. Even the scripture that was read as he prepared to pray by Pastor Frankie was an appropriate scripture where the Apostle Paul reminds us that it is for freedom that God has set us free and God never wants us to return to the incarceration and oppression from which we've been freed. My father, who was a pastor, reminded our church and taught me that a people without a knowledge of their history are like a tree without roots. And one of the things that happens whenever you begin to forget your history and forget your God is that you allow your roots to be taken up so that you can cease to be who God has made and called you to be. It is a danger for us to forget who it is that has brought us over. So what's the danger of forgetting? I'm glad you asked. The first reason that it's a danger to forget is if you forget, you will forget where you came from. You will forget where you came from. You will forget where you came from. You and I did not come from the BVI and the United States of America. You and I came from the cradle of civilization. You and I came from that continent that has the richest natural resources of any continent in the entire world, Africa. You and I came from a land that was flowing with milk and honey and prosperity. You and I came from that land with riches in its soil, with diamonds and with gold beneath the surface of the soil because it reminds us of the riches that we have beneath the surface of our soul. 
you and I have come from a great land, a land of royalty, of royal lineage, of kings and of queens. Queens like Nefertiti and kings like Akhenaten and the queen of Sheba and Solomon and so many others. We come from major dynasties in Africa where there were kings and queens living in palaces adorned in ivory and gold when others were living in caves during the ice age. We were civilized before the rest of the world knew what civilization really was. You come from kings. You come from queens. You come from those who are responsible for creating science and biology and arithmetic and religion and theology and philosophy and medicine and architecture and construction and mining and so many other things that have been introduced to the world. You come from that line of great men and women whom God has kissed with nature's son. Oh, but when you start to forget, then you'll forget where you came from and you'll let what you're in define you rather than inform you. You cannot allow what has happened to you to become the definition of you. Just because we have slavery in our history does not mean that we should have a slave mentality. That we should never view ourselves as less than anybody else, as beneath anybody else, as not as significant as anybody else. And therefore, we should never be ashamed of who we are. When you forget, you'll forget where you've come from. God wanted Moses to remind the Hebrew people where they came from, that they had a history before they ever found themselves in Egyptian slavery. But not only that, the danger in forgetting is that you will not only forget where you come from, but you'll forget who brought you thus far. You'll forget who brought you thus far. You'll forget who brought you thus far. Far. You should never, ever give the British government, nor the United States government, or any other European government that was involved in slavery credit for your freedom. Your and my freedom is not because of their generosity. Obviously, they didn't have any generosity in their spirit because they would not have enslaved other human beings in the first place. But the reason that you and I were freed from slavery and bondage is because we cried out to God. And God heard our prayer. God heard our cry. God saw our affliction. God was sensitive to our pain. And God said, enough of this. I've got to deliver my people from bondage or else I can't really be their God. God can't be the God of liberation and fail to liberate. And what we've got to be careful of in this day and age where we're driving nice cars and living in nice homes and wearing nice jewelry and wearing nice clothes and designer clothes and able to go different places and do different things, we can't get to the point where we think we don't need God. Young people, you need God. Old people, you need God. All people, we need God. If it were not for the Lord who was on our side, where would we be? Don't forget how you got here. It was not because of your education. It was not because of your skill. It was not because of your intelligence. It was not because of the people that you know. It was not because of anything else that you've done on your own and with your own strength. But it's because our ancestors, our mothers and our fathers and our mothers' mothers and our fathers' fathers knew how to go to God and say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know if thou withdraw thyself from me, whether she shall I go? Whatever you do, don't forget about God. It's, it's God who's almighty. 
It's God who created everything without whom there would be no thing if God had not created something. And God is so awesome that scholars say that God created the world ex nihilo. That means that God created something out of nothing and then took the something that he made out of nothing and hung it on somewhere that he brought out of nowhere. That's the kind of God we have. We have that God who is the God of miracles and the God of justice, the God who is a defender, the God who is a warrior, the God who is a fighter, the God who is a provider, the God who is a keeper. Oh, yes. We've got to make sure that we remember God, that we remember our need for God. And that means that we can't settle for religion. We need to ensure that we have a relationship. Don't just believe there is a God. You need to know God. And the Bible says that God has been pleased to make himself known through Jesus Christ. And so don't forget where you come from. Don't forget who brought you this far. It's God that brought you this far. It's God that brought you out of bondage. It's God that sustained you when you didn't have enough money to pay your bills. It's God that put clothes on your back when you couldn't afford them. It's God that put food on your table and in your stomach when you otherwise would have starved and gone hungry. It is God who blessed you to put your children in school. It's God that blessed you to work in the government. It's God that has been on your side. So whatever you do, don't forget, because if you forget, you'll forget where you come from. You'll forget who brought you thus far, but finally, you'll forget your responsibility. You'll forget your responsibility. You'll forget your responsibility. Your responsibility is to tell your children and to tell your children's children and your children's children's children what God has done. That's why this well is so significant. That's why this well is so important. It's so significant that we gather at the well so that generations can understand this is the place where God made people that were so selfish and sick and so evil give up what they wanted to hold on to. Yeah, this is the place where God made them read the Emancipation Proclamation to set free your ancestors. This is the place. And our young people need to know that there's a place that they can look at when they wonder whether or not God's going to work on their behalf, that there needs to be a place that they can walk by and ride by and see that's where God proved that God is on our side and we've got a responsibility. To make sure that we tell the story, we have a responsibility to make certain that we never put self over service to one another. Oh, yes. You can't really serve one another well if you're fighting with and competing with one another. We have a responsibility to make sure that every generation gets better and better, stronger and stronger, has more and more opportunity. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to review our history, to rehearse our history, and to recite our history, and to be proud of our history. The Jewish people have gone through a lot historically. We know about the atrocities of neo-Nazi Germany and Poland under the hand of Adolf Hitler, who literally burnt alive thousands of Jews and persecuted many others. And when the Holocaust was over and certain Jews survived, they made a commitment to themselves and to future generations, and it summed up in two words, never again oh yeah never again never again honorable mark vanderpool really hit the nail on the head when he began to talk about 
how slavery was about economics and how if we're not careful, we'll overlook the fact that economics are still critical today. Therefore, others benefit from keeping you poor. They benefit from putting a lid on how far you can rise. They benefit from limiting the power that you can gain. They limit and they benefit from how they can keep you in certain areas and keep you from other areas. We, we have to make sure that we pay attention to history because if we don't learn our history, then history is bound to repeat itself in different forms. In the United States of America right now, there are over one million African American males in prison. That is more males in prison than there were in slavery in the 1800s. If we're not careful, history will repeat itself in a different form. Are you listening to me? And so we've got to be vigilant and be, be watchful of how it is that these cycles sometimes are not broken unless we pay attention and accept our responsibility to make sure that we all prosper. That means that we have to engage in cooperative economics. That means that we have to support one another's businesses. That means that when we do business, we're not always looking for a deal. That means that we understand that somebody else's ice is not colder than ours. It means that we understand that we can no longer submit to what in America was called the Willie Lynch syndrome. Willie Lynch wrote a letter to a slave master who asked, how can I control my slaves? And he wrote back and he said, you pit them against one another. Light skin against dark skin, broad nose against thin nose, big lips against thin lips, house Negro against field Negro. They, they, they wrote this up and said, if you keep them fighting against one another, they won't have time or attention to fight against you. And how tragic it is that in some parts of the world, I know it's in the United States. It's probably not here in the BVI because you're better than us. But, but in certain parts of the world, we still have what Naeem Akbar would call psychological chains of slavery. And so we treat each other as if we are less than our oppressors. No, no, no. No, no, no. At the least, we're equal to. And historically, we're actually better than. <laughs> oh yeah, we're actually historically better than. But, but we can't keep turning on one another. We can't be crabs in a barrel trying to pull one another down every time one gets up. No, we have to learn that when one gets up, they don't get up and forget about everybody else, but they lift others as they climb. Are you listening? That's a part of our responsibility to our culture and to our history. Don't be ashamed of your history. And don't let anyone tell you to stop talking about slavery. Don't let anybody tell you to get over it because uh, people don't tell the Jews to get over the Holocaust. Are you listening? Whatever you do, don't forget your responsibility to one another and to future generations. You got to make sure that you engage in your responsibility to resist every form of injustice. Martin Luther King Jr. put it this way, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I go to my seat now. But I've come by to caution you as Moses did the Hebrew people about the danger of forgetting. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget how you made it thus far and who brought you here. And don't forget that you have a responsibility to yourself, to your community, and to the future generations. There's greatness inside of you and you must now free yourself from the fear of your greatness. 
Nelson Mandela was inaugurated as president of South Africa on May the 9th, 1994. And during his inaugural speech, he borrowed a poem from Marianne Williamson entitled, Our Deepest Fear. Where Williamson wrote these words, and I quote, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Who? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give our people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Don't be afraid of the greatness that's in you. Remember that you have a great lineage. You have a great God. You have a great responsibility. But finally, you have a great future. And so remember that the same God who's brought us this far is the same God who will lead us on to greater heights and deeper depths. May you never forget the Lord your God and forget those who have gone before you to pave the way. Hallelujah to the God of liberation. Amen. Wow. We give God praise for that powerful word. Let's all stand together as we get ready to go down from here. Don't ever forget the danger of forgetting. We forget where we've come from. We forget who it is that brought us this far. And we forget our responsibility. There's a song that says, we shall overcome. It's in your program. I want everybody to, let's sing this together. And I pray that we would hasten the day when indeed we do overcome. And it's incumbent upon all of us to do everything we can to help one another. We shall overcome. Let's sing together. Uh, Dwight, my brother, would you come and just help me out? Yeah, he's going to lead us on. Amen. Amen. We shall overcome. And by the way, uh, Reverend Lee is not just a preacher, but he's also a musician. Oh, they shut it down? Oh, my goodness. What a shame. We were going to be treated by some. The keyboard is all right. That's all he needs. <laughs> Let's welcome Reverend Lee on keyboard. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome something more deep in my
Dwight Hutchinson Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we're just about ready to close, but I want to just say, and in fear of forgetting someone, I'll just say generally, I am so pleased for everyone who came out and everyone who participate. I want to thank everyone, all of the government officials, all of the members of the clergy, everyone who came out today to make this celebration a great success. And I trust that as we leave here today, it would not just be that we've come, we've heard, and we forget, but that what we've heard will now put into practice because the Bible says, faith without works is? Dead. Faith without works is? Dead. Faith without works is? Dead. And dead faith is no faith. So let's put our words and our beliefs and all, everything into action. And when everybody else said it can't be done, God says it will be done. If you receive that, say amen. amen. Now I want you to hold your neighbor's hand as we invite Pastor Frankie Raffinum to give us the benediction. Let's unite as one. Let us pray. God, you, you look down on us and we know that your love extends. And you love each and every one of us. Your grace abounds towards us. We come to you in our time of need and you are there. And the good thing is, Father, that we can come boldly. We can come without fear, guilt, condemnation. We can come without any remorse, knowing that you have taken care of our sins. And you have taken care of all our shortcomings. And we thank you, O oh God, for your presence that is with us. Your Holy Spirit that is with us every day. We thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for what was accomplished. We thank you for the word that we have heard. We thank you for the songs and the poems and the plays. But let us not forget. Let us remember. But let us remember not with anger, but let us remember with the clear understanding that we are free and we are delivered from that past. And as we remember, 
Let us rejoice because you have brought us this far and we see the future greater. We see where we are going is much greater than where we are now. And so, Father, we give you praise and thanks. We thank, thank you, Father, for everything that you have done today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, you're dismissed.